Hello everyone and welcome to Bombless Dentistry. In this video, we'll talk about one of the most common conditions with which patients present to the orthodontic clinics that is called as class 1 malocclusion. Now, in this video, we'll talk about in depth starting out from introduction, geology, clinical features, investigation, and then finally talking about how do we manage such cases when they present to the orthodontic clinics. So let's get started. Now, in previous videos, we have talked about the different molar relations that are present. We have class 1, class 2, and class 3 now. The normal molar relation is basically class 1 molar relation in which the mesiobuccal cusp of the upper molar is coinciding with the buccal groove of lower first molar. This is called as normal class 1 molar relation. However, in certain patients, for example, patients with class 1 malocclusion, Although they do have normal molar relation, but there are other malocclusion which can either be in maxilla, mandible or in both the arches. Now, what are the malocclusions that can be present? For example, the teeth can be rotated, malposed, impacted and there are other malocclusions as well which can be present in either of the arch or both of the arch. So, we'll talk about these malocclusions, class 1 malocclusion in detail now. Now, talking about the etiology of class 1 malocclusion, we can divide them into three categories. Either they can be developmental in origin, genetic or environmental. Starting off from developmental, teeth can be either impacted, they can be malposed, they, there can be even supernumerary teeth, teeth can be congenitally missing as well by birth or they can be ectopic eruption as well. For, for example, teeth have erupted in their abnormal position, not in their normal position, which is called as ectopic eruption. Now, secondly, there can be some genetic causes as well. For example, there is some discrepancy in the teeth and jaw size. For example, teeth can be either larger or smaller than their normal size and similarly for the jaws as well. We talk about environmental factors. They can be further categorized into two categories. They can be either present from birth or they can occur throughout life. If you talk about by birth, they can be fetal molding. And secondly, which is more common is that trauma during birth. For example, there can be use of forceps which can help in the delivery and the use of such forceps can damage the jaws of the baby. So that can lead to such malocclusions. Now, if you talk about throughout life, for example, there can be premature loss of primary teeth, there can be damage to the permanent tooth but or there can be direct damage to the permanent teeth as well. So, these are the three categories of etiology that can be responsible for class 1 malocclusions. Now, the most common form of malocclusion which is present in class 1 malocclusions is called as bimaxillary protrusion. Now, what do we mean by bimaxillary protrusion? In this case, there is class 1 molar relation, which is the normal molar relation. However, there is excessive protrusion or pronathism of maxilla and mandible as well. Both maxilla and mandible, they are forward positioned as compared to their normal values. Now, we can also judge that using cephalometrics. For example, patient can have higher SNA which represents maxilla and SNB which represents mandible. So the values of both of these angles will be greater than their normal value. So if that is the case, th this can give us an idea that the patient might have bimaxillary protrusion. So this is the most common form of class 1 malocclusions. Now if you talk about the clinical features of bimaxillary protrusion first and then we move on towards the general features as to what features are found in class 1 malocclusion, we'll talk about that later in the video. But first, we'll talk about bimaxillary protrusions, clinical features. They can be divided into two categories. First, there are extraoral features and then there are intraoral features. If you talk about extraoral features, if you see in this video, there is decreased nasolabial angle. In normal patients, the nasolabial angle approaches just about 90 degrees more or less. However, in cases of bimaxillary protrusion, if you see the nasolabial angle, 
that is decreased because the four, the most common cause of this is due to proclined maxillary anterior teeth because these teeth which are present over they are proclined they push the lips a bit outward so therefore this angle nasolabial angle it decreases second there is shallow mentolabial sulcus due to proclined mandibular anterior now if you see the lips they are protruded outward and there is proclination of mandibular anterior teeth as well therefore this mentolabial sulcus which is present over here this decreases also if you note that the lips are not co uh, competent because normally in normal position if you close your mouth in a relaxed position they are competent the lips meet they slightly touch but in these cases since there is proclination of anterior upper and lower teeth there is lips incompetence and facial profile in such patients is also convex for example it's like this in this manner it's convex in appearance now if we move on towards the intraoral features of biomaxillary protrusion as we have talked before there will be proclined mandibular and maxillary anterior teeth which you can also appreciate in this clinical picture not that prominent but they are prominent like the degree of prominence of mandibular and maxillary teeth varies from patient to patient. In some patients it can be very excessive, but in some patients it can be excessive but not that excessive. Secondly, if you also appreciate in this picture there is class 1 motor relation present. And now, canine can sometimes be in class 1 uh, relation but not always. Similarly, in some patients we can also encounter spacing but not in all of the patients. Now, if we talk about cephalometrics of such condition, which in case this is biomaxillary protrusion if you note there will be decreased interincisal angle also if you note we can see that there is proclination of an upper anterior and lower anterior, uh, anterior teeth also if you note if we measure the angles especially SNA and SNB angle which you can have an idea by looking at this cephalometric uh, diagram you can see that there is excessive SNA and SNB angle which represents pronacism. So if that is the case and we have a normal class 1 molar relation, we can suspect that the patient might be suffering from biomaxillary protrusion. Now if we talk about the general features of a patient suffering from class 1 malocclusion, it can be divided into extraoral and intraoral features. Firstly, if we talk about extraoral features, normally we have three different type of facial profile. It can be either straight profile which is in class 1 it can be a bit concave in appearance which is in class 3 and in class 2 which is a bit convex appearance so in this uh, case for example uh, patient with class 1 malocclusion you can appreciate that the facial profile is straight and there is harmonious face as you can see by just looking at the face we cannot tell whether the patient is suffering from any malocclusion but if we see our patient who is suffering from class 3, we can see by this facial profile that yes, patient is suffering from some malocclusion and similarly for class 2 patient as well because of this convex appearance. Now, if we talk about some intraoral features of patients who are suffering from class 1 malocclusion, firstly, we can appreciate that there is class 1 moral relation as you can see in this picture as well. Canines can also be in class 1 malocclusion. Uh, Canine can also be in class 1 relation sometimes or sometimes not. Same goes for incisors as well. They can be in class 1 relation or cannot be in class 1 relation. Spacing, sometimes we do encounter spacing. Spacing can also be present. In some patient we can also have crowding. For example, in this case you can see that patient has class 1 malocclusion. But there are some crowding as well. In some patients as we have just discussed before, they can also be biomaxillary protrusion. In some cases, we can also have cross bites. Similarly, in other cases, we can also have open bite. As you can see in this picture, there is no vertical overlap between the upper and lower teeth. So there is open bite. And then in some patients, we can also encounter deep bite. As you can see in this picture, there is excessive overlap between the upper and the lower anterior teeth. And finally, in some patients, we can also encounter some rotations as well, as you can see in this picture as well. So these are the clinical features in some patients we can have all of these features and in some patients we can have some selective features so these are the clinical features that we can appreciate in a patient who is suffering from class 1 malocclusion
Now, if we move on towards diagnosing as to how to be diagnosed that the patient is actually suffering from class 1 malocclusion, firstly, we'll take a history of the patient. For example, patient have any habits, for example, thumb sucking, tongue thrusting, any habits which can give us an idea just that patient ha might have some malocclusion. Secondly, we'll go for clinical examination. As we've just discussed before, we will clinically examine the patient. Firstly, looking for all the extra oral features and then secondly, looking for all the intraoral features. We can also make some study models and cost which can also give us an idea about the malocclusion. Radiographs. Radiographs such as OPG gives us an idea whether there is some malocclusion or not. But more specifically, cephalometrics is done as you can see here that we take an x-ray of this uh, patient and in this case we can then draw a diagram and in this diagram you can see we can measure SNA, SNB angles and then we also know the molar relation. So these values are very important and these values then give us a definitive diagnosis that which type of malocclusion the patient is suffering from and when we know the type of malocclusion the patient is suffering from then we can give the proper management to that patient because if we do not have made a proper diagnosis our treatment plan for the patient will indefinitely be prolonged and in some cases fail as well. So it is very important to perform cephalometrics in every patient carefully so that we can reach a definitive diagnosis. Now moving on towards how do we manage such cases? We have talked about what are the etiological features which can cause malocclusion. We have talked about clinical features and then we have investigated as to whether the patient is actually suffering from class 1 malocclusion or not. And now we have reached that stage that yes, we know that the patient is suffering from class 1 malocclusion. Now, how will we treat such cases? The aims of the treatment is basically to treat crowding if it's present, biomaxillary protrusion if present, any rotation, deep bite, cross bite, open bite and spacing. So our entire management of such patient rotates around this theme that is, has been drawn right in front of you. So we'll focus on all of these things and not in every patient all of this is present. In some patients some condition will be present and in some patient even entire features can be appreciated as well. So let's talk about these management of every individual condition one by one. Now firstly talking about crowding. Crowding in patients can be divided into three categories. Either it can be mild which is less than 4 mm per arch. It can be moderate which is 5 to 9 mm per arch or it can be severe which is more than 10 mm or equal to 10 mm per arch. Now the treatment varies depending on whether it is mild, moderate or severe. If it's mild there is no need for any extraction. We will not go for an extraction. We can do proximal stripping that is proximally we will wear off some um, part of the tooth and sometimes we can also give a Z spring and labial bow as well. If it's moderate which is between 5 to 9 mm per arch we have to do some arch expansion so that there is space for the teeth to be accommodated. Now in that cases we can go for quad helix as you can see in this picture. This helps to move these teeth in this direction so that space is created and the teeth can be properly accommodated in the arch. Sometimes we can also go for molar distalization. Now in molar distalization the molar is moved distally so that space is created to the teeth which are present anterior to it. In severe cases which is more than 10 mm per arch we have to extract all pores. Now all pores are your all first Perma permanent first premolars, upper permanent first premolars and lower permanent first premolars. So we will extract all of the fours. We will retract K9 so that space is created for the incisors. We can use labial bow for anterior alignment for aligning these anterior teeth. And then we can also go for Holly's retainer for retention because there are some chances of relapse. So Holly's retainer can retain the results that we have obtained after doing all of these things. So this is how we will manage crowding of the patient and also keeping in mind that what is the degree of crowding that we have just discussed but also we have to note the size and position as to where the crowding in the arch is present and then lastly age of the patient is also really important so we will keep my keep in mind all of these conditions when we are treating crowding of the patient.
Now, if we talk about spacing, which is the second uh, management do, that we do in patients who are suffering from class one malocclusion, spacing basically simply means that there is spacing in teeth. For example, as you can see in this diagram, there are spaces between the teeth. So this is spacing. However, in normal teeth, in healthy teeth, there is no spacing. There is physiological contact between all of the teeth. So spacing can either be localized or in, that is present in some part of the arch, for example, in the anterior area of maxilla or posterior area of the mandible. It can be generalized as well. For example, it's present throughout the arch. Now, if you talk about localized, localized can be either there is more than 3 mm diastema present. For example, canine has erupted and there is still spacing present because normally in ugly duckling stage when the canine has erupted, the space, the sl some spaces which are present, especially in the anterior teeth, they are closed but in some cases even the canine has erupted and the space is still not closed so in that cases we will diagnose it as localized spacing other than that there can be some missing teeth some supernumerary teeth and then lastly abnormal labial frenum attachment these are the conditions which can give rise to spacing specifically localized spacing on the other hand if we talk about generalized spacing now, generalized spacing can be due to mainly microdontia. Now, what do we mean by microdontia? Microdontia simply means that the teeth are smaller than their normal size. So, since they are smaller than the normal size, this will lead to spacing between the teeth. Now, there are different treatment options which are present. The treatment options are different from localized and they are different from generalized. In localized cases, for example, if there is abnormal penile attachment, so we can go for phrenectomy that is we'll excise the frenum and move it a bit uh, superiorly so that the space can be closed we can also go for finger spring and dental implants and similarly for generalized spacing we can go for dental implants now moving on towards treating crossbite simply if we talk about the definition of crossbite crossbite simply means that there is abnormal buccolingual relation now Crossbite can either be anteriorly or posteriorly. Anteriorly, they can either, either involve a single tooth or multiple teeth. If we talk about posteriorly, same goes for anterior. It can either be a single teeth or there can be multiple teeth. Now, more specifically, crossbite can either be unilateral or they can be bilateral. Now, treatment option varies if the tooth is singly, singly involved or there are multiple teeth. For single teeth, anteriorly, we can go for Z spring. As you can see in this picture, this tooth is in a crossbite relation and this Z spring pushes the teeth in this anterior direction, thereby correcting the crossbite. However, if multiple teeth are involved, for example, there are all of the anterior teeth are involved, then we have to go for expansion screw, which looks something like this. So this, these are some appliances which can be used to treat anterior crossbite. Now, if we talk about posterior teeth, for example, only one tooth is involved in the posterior teeth. For example, only mandible is, um, for example, only a molar is involved. So we can go for cross elastics. Other than that, if multiple teeth are involved, we can go for quad helix. As you can see in this picture, these teeth which are highlighted blue, they are involved in cross bite. So this quad helix pushes the teeth in this outward direction, thereby expanding the arch and then eventually correcting the cross bite. We can also go for W arch appliance, coffin spring as you can see in this picture and Hyrax appliance. Hyrax is a, uh, it can be banded or bonded depending on the patient and as you can see this picture represents the Hyrax appliance which in this case you can see it is applying outward force and this outward force will lead to expansion of the arch and then that expansion will finally treat the cross bite. Now, if you talk about open bite, now what is open bite? Open bite simply means that there is no vertical overlap between the teeth, specifically the anterior teeth. Now, if we talk about the management options that are available to treat open bite, they can be divided into two parts, either in mixed dentation and if we encounter an open bite in mixed dentation, we can treat it by habit bringing because sometimes Patients have a habit when they are children as thumb sucking. So this can lead to an open bite. So firstly, we have to check whether the patient has that habit or not. If the patient has that habit, we have to go for habit breaker. 
and such habit breakers can be used in late mixed and early permanent dentation as well. Other than that, if sometimes primary molars become ankylosed, so that also leads to open bite specifically in the posterior region. So that primary molar has to be extracted now. In children, if there is skeletal open bite, that means that there is something wrong with the maxilla and mandible, we can go for functional appliance. For example, bionator, as you can see in this picture, bionator can be used to correct open bite and frankel appliance can also be used. But in adults, if the open bite has been diagnosed, since we cannot modify maxilla and mandible anymore because they have completed their growth, they have completed their growth, we have to go for orthognathic surgery. So this is how we manage open bite. Moving on towards deep bite, deep bite simply means that there is excessive overlap between the anterior incisor, but more specifically if you talk about it. So in growing age, deep bite can be corrected by using anterior bite plane. As you can see, the patient bites and then there is some space created in the posterior teeth. Posterior teeth, they do not occlude. So when they, they do not occlude, they lead to excessive eruption and that excessive eruption then helps to decrease the deep bite anteriorly and therefore leading to a normal overlap. Now, in some cases, we can also intrude the anterior teeth and how can we intrude the anterior teeth? We can use fixed appliances and other than that, we can also go for J-hook vertical pull headgear as you can see in this picture. The in anterior teeth are pulled in this direction, therefore intruding it. And lastly, in non-growing patient, for example, in adult patient, the only option that we have is orthognathic surgery. If we talk about biomaxillary protrusion in class 1 malocclusion patients, we have to extract all of the four, all four upper two and lower two permanent first premolars. We have to extract them and then in some cases, Treatment depends on inclination of canine. If the canine is inclined distally, so we have to retract the canine, align incisors and we have to use retainer so that we can maintain the result. But in some cases, when the canines are inclined mesially, then we have to go for fixed appliance. As you can see in this cephalometric diagram, we can appreciate that there is excessive SNA and SNB angle, which gives us the uh, diagnosis that the patient is suffering from biomaxillary protrusion. So this is how we will treat biomaxillary protrusion. Now lastly talking about rotations. Rotations can be treated either if they are single tooth or they are multiple teeth. If they are a, a single tooth, we can use double cantilever spring. As you can see in this picture, this that can help us in derotating the tooth. We can also go for labial bow as you can see in this picture. This is a labial bow. And then lastly, if there are multiple teeth involved, we have to go for fixed appliance, which is braces. So in this video, we talked about everything and in depth that is related to class one malocclusion, starting from its introduction, etiology, clinical features, investigations. And then finally, we talked about management as to how will we manage patients who are suffering from class one malocclusion. So I hope this video was useful for you. And if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe and press the bell icon. Thank you for watching this video. See you next time.